Welcome to all of you zooming in from various parts of the world, including California, Oregon, Rhode Island, and other parts. We're here to celebrate the artists of the Art of Empathy, a weed-sponsored online exhibition that will be posted online from November 15th to February 15th, so you have a little bit more time to see it. I'm Mary White, co-chair of WEED with our co-chair Manush Zomoradinia and Christina Bertia, WEED board member and organizer of this event, and Tanya Geis, WEED board member and juror of the exhibition. We're here to celebrate the artists of the art of empathy and um, part the recordings of both parts one and two presentations will be posted on our website. So look forward to sharing that with your mailing list. Women's Eco Artist Dialogue was founded in 1996 and is a volunteer run collective of female identified visual artists, writers, curators, art historians, researchers, scientists, and others interested in highlighting the intersection of art and ecological issues. We'll start with the land acknowledgements. And if you wish, please add your location and land acknowledgement in the chat. Weed's office sits on the territory of the Wichen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chonio speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the Va sovereign Verona band of Alameda County, near one of the largest shell mounds in the Bay Area. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familiar descendants of the Verona band. We recognize the Muwekma Ohlone tribe who are campaigning to become federally recognized, the association of Rometush Ohlone who are researching, revitalizing and preserving Rometush Ohlone history and culture and the confederated villages of Lezan and Socorate Land Trust who are working to return native land back to indigenous stewardship and just transferred a piece of property in Berkeley a few months ago. Zoom housekeeping. Um, we're recording this session and please keep your audio muted during the presentation. The host may mute you if there's extra noise. And if you have questions during the presentation, uh, put them in the chat. And then when we get to the question and answer section, we can look at them first. So now I'd like to introduce Tanya Geis. Thank you, Mary. Um, I think I'm going to start uh, with the screen sharing. Uh, let's just make sure it's working for everybody before I start. Um, are you guys seeing that okay? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And let me see if I can play it properly. Okay. Is that filling your whole screen now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. So hello, everybody. Um, my name is Tanya Geis. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, I am a visual artist, and I'm also uh, the juror for this exhibition, as well as a, a board member um, for a Women's Eco Art Dialogue. Uh, I would first like to start by thanking Weed for inviting me to be a juror for this show. Um, I also really wanted to thank all of the participating artists for submitting such powerful and diverse work. Um, and particularly the exhibition committee for coming together to put on such a stunning and successful exhibition. And especially I wanted to call out Christina Bertea and Deanna Pinnell in particular for their leadership in organizing this exhibition and these presentations. So thank you so much to everyone. Um, this exhibition, The Power of Empathy, explores paths through the environmental and social justice challenges that confront our world, considering the experience of all living beings, human and more than human, and individuals and communities of organisms possessing all forms of sentience. What might an empathetic world look like? How can we inspire recognition and kindness, transcending the fear of others and assumptions of human exceptionalism? How do we summon compassion in times of great difficulty? How can we resist apathy? And how can we help others to resist it? How do we cultivate empathy? The works presented in The Power of Empathy 
together tell a rich story about how empathy, when channeled through art, has enormous potential to nurture intimacy, connection, and love, and inspire cross-species and cross-ecological witnessing, mourning, embodiment, and care. Today, we'll be hearing from 10 of our 20 artists in the exhibition. They will be presenting in alphabetical order, with each of the artists speaking for about five minutes about their work and their practice. There will also be some time at the end for discussion and questions. We will start with Celia Anderson, whose dreamy paintings created during the beginning of the COVID pandemic offer moving meditations on the practice of caring for others and its transformational potential. Then we will have Lorraine Bonner's evocative clay sculptures that speak to the dissolution of boundaries between people and between humans and animals and the possibilities therein. Ember de Boer's sculptures use commercial and industrial materials to create organic landscapes, honoring the history and pain of human impacts on the planet. Marla Faith's mixed media collage is a colorful, imaginative interpretation of the devastation of hurricanes and the healing that can follow in their wake. Linda Ford's sculptures and interventions relate the crevices of our bodies and our built environment to the topography of the planet asking us to see the landscape in ourselves and ourselves in the landscape. Linda Gass's ethereal layered installation examines the changes over time of the Santa Ana Rivershed, highlighting the strengths and needs of the underserved communities in the watershed. Drawing on their own experience, Amori Morris's vibrant and dynamic paintings, painting confronts how lack of access to green space and spaces for play as a result of racist and classist urban planning, adversely affects children from black and low income families. Leslie Plato Smith's colorful watercolor portraits of human animal solidarity propose a relationship that forgoes exploitation in favor of empathy and kinship. Emily Van Engel's colorful semi abstract watercolors invite us to imagine a future in which we have overcome the climate crisis and healed our relationship with one another and with the planet. Finally, Michelle Waters' graphic paintings show the organ of the heart connected via delicate veins to animals suffering at the hands of humans, asking us to imagine what a more empathetic world might look like. With no further ado, I pass it over to Celia Anderson. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Celia Anderson. I live in um, Kenai, Alaska. I'm a figurative artist uh, using the human form to encourage people to think, to feel, and to question. Um, I like to um, provide a sort of story in my work, uh, one in which the viewer might see something of themselves or their own situations or circumstances. Um, my work is usually um, socio-political in nature. <clears throat> um, all three pieces I have in this show are about small gestures, uh, gestures of kindness, of love, of sacrifice. And these gestures have huge impacts and huge, um, huge substance. Um, and um, anyway, the, the uh, first two pieces are about the pandemic. And as you can see in this piece, this is called uh, A Matter of Heart. And um, this piece uh, speaks to uh, the impact that all those doctors, nurses, and general public had uh, who wore masks had on the um, uh, containment and, um, of the virus. Um, it also is about their reverence for life and their respect for the lives of others. <clears throat> um, and actually their sacrifice too, as some of them are no longer with us. Um, the second piece um, I have in the show um, is called If Only. <clears throat> and if you could bring that up, that would be great. Um, and as you know, um, all those people who had loved ones um, in nursing homes during the height of the pandemic, couldn't visit them and um, they couldn't uh, comfort them. They couldn't touch them. And this piece speaks to the importance of connection and, um, and especially uh, the ability to touch someone um, and the importance of that to health and wellness and 
uh, really to life itself. The third piece I have in the show um, is called The Giver. And, um, and this is a piece that was uh, one in a body of work that I did celebrating the um, uh, value of ordinary people. And this depicts a volunteer at our local food bank in Kenai, where they serve hundreds of meals every day to needy families in our area. And some of those volunteers were actually people who received um, some services from the food bank and have come back to help. Um, now I wanted to just share a brief um, encounter I had and uh, one that was a, a small, um, um, you know, gesture of kindness that had some impact. Um, I was deplaning in Seattle and uh, we were all backed up trying to get onto the jetway, but we were backed up because someone up in front of us was struggling with their um, belongings. And um, when I got up a little closer, I saw that it was a young woman of color who was struggling with um, a dog she had out of a carrier. She had a baby and some kind of a stroller contraption and she was dropping things. Anyway, when I got up to her, I said, say, could I help you? And she, uh, she just stared at me and I said, you know, maybe I could take your dog up the top of the jetway and wait for you. And um, she was having trouble trusting me, I could tell, but she finally acquiesced and I went, took the dog and I went up and uh, waited for her. And when she finally came up, um, she was really relieved to see me. She rest, rushed over, collected the dog, nodded to me and started to walk off. And then she stopped and she turned around and said to me, God bless you. And I thought, wow, I hadn't done anything extraordinary, but yet it had this impact. And in that moment, I, I got a glimpse of what it might be like to walk in her shoes. And my takeaway from this is that we just shouldn't discount these small gestures of kindness because they compound and collectively, they inspire trust. And trust is what we need to have in order to work together to solve some of our bigger problems. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Lorraine, uh, Lorraine Bonner and I'm a sculptor. Uh, I work in clay. Uh, I never did art until I was in my late 30s or when I was flooded with uh, memories of severe uh, childhood sexual abuse. Then a friend gave me a bag of clay and little people started emerging from my fingers. The clay was my therapist and my teacher through many layers of obscene uh, abuse by my father and others who looked perfectly normal in the world of family and community. The clay gave me um, a deeper understanding of denial and, um, and, um, and of the bland faced sociopaths who were driving the climate catastrophe and ecocide and furtherance of their power. This slide is called One Blood. It's an image of the swirling energy of creation. On one side emerges the face of a bird, on the other, the face of a human being. Obviously a lot easier to see in the round. This is the oneness that transcends permeates and binds together all lives in the universe. This state is not empathy, but as transcendent oneness, as I call it, condenses into the molecular biology of our brains, empathy is one of the pro-social behavioral outcomes. You could have the next slide. This is called uh, <clears throat> the great divide. Uh, it's two people regarding each other over a chalkboard with a chalk line between them. They are both made of the same clay. One has features suggestive of African descent, the other of European descent. The chalk line can be easily brushed away, but sociopathic education teaches us that the line is both permanent and confers value. This kind of educational violence, like all forms of political violence and violence generally, is uh, very traumatic and trauma overwhelms all of our pro-social neurologic capacities, including empathy, like heavy surf carves out the seacoast. A traumatized person believes herself to be all alone. 
the purpose, I believe, of manifesting empathy in art and in daily life is to wake people from the trauma-induced delusion of separation, scarcity, and lethal competitiveness to enable us to access and act from our own pro-social capacity, pro-social as opposed to antisocial. But the Great Divide also represents another area of separation which has to be addressed. This is the problem of dark. The Europeans, the people of the so-called enlightenment erased the sanctity of the dark. When they came upon dark-skinned people, it was so easy to invent the concept of race, associating white with goodness, holiness, purity, and so forth, and black with the opposite became a way of kind of outsourcing and veiling their power. Even today, it is only with great difficulty that black skin can be associated with honor, intelligence, and beauty, and not criminality, contagion, and incompetence. This makes true empathy quite difficult. But people, could we see the next slide, please? People, the human species, we come in all shades of brown. Only generations of denial of this reality can allow us to use the terms black and white to identify ourselves or one another. In my series of multi-hued humanity, I illustrate this reality using a variety of clay bodies of different colors. This piece, multi-hued humanity and black embrace in mutual healing is about all of us, whatever our skin color, however the sociopaths have misnamed us, embracing the sacred black, the dark, the yin, the earth, the feminine, nature, all that the sociopaths have taught us to hate, fear, and exploit, all that they have named as the other, all of our kin. Thank you. Thank you, Larian. Thank you. Ember. Hey, my name is Ember DeBoer. I'm a sculpture artist based in Sacramento, California. And um, in relationship to the theme, the power of empathy, I submitted this work because it was a personal journey with empathy for me when I made this work. Um, I didn't grow up in California. I was uh, born and raised in Kansas City. And I've only lived here for about four years, maybe five now. And the five years I've lived here have been extreme in the environmental sense. It has caused um, an, an interesting rift um, internally in me um, moving here because I, I fell aligned with what I saw when I visited and I thought it was beautiful and it was very different than where I grew up. And, and that inspired me. And I came here to spend more time with the natural environment in Northern California. And in that, in the time I've been here, I've had to cope with um, being a young person amidst the changes, the international and global changes we all feel and see in the environment. And I know that the people in this room here are very passionate about this issue too. It's why we come together. And so this piece felt the most aligned with power of empathy. But it's not only this piece that has inspired um, me as an artist. I, I started illuminating some of my works and backing the glass with more um, brighter objects and brighter colors so that the illumination would shine through. Because what I found was that when people resonated with a, a fading light or a, a, an illumination within the work, they had moments of empathy with objects. Similar in a lot of ways, I feel like people have moments of empathy with nature. Um, and uh, my empathy and my understanding of the environment, it was a tough one. I, uh, my work has always been about tragic beauty. And so in this work specifically, I was going through grief as well. I mourning the idea of um, the fires and having never experienced fires like the ones in California and experiencing and learning about the drought and its effects. Um, even as we speak right now, I live down, down the road from the river and it is 10, 10 feet higher than normal as we speak. And I drive by it every day on my way to work 
everywhere I go, I see it. And um, so I was I was grieving and mourning about the environment. And I think that moments of empathy are where that comes from. We, we see things and we're affected by it. And so the Northern California environment empowered me to move here. It inspired me to see more. And I've also have to watch it erode in many ways. Um, when it still feels like I, I've barely got to experience a fraction of how much I'd love to see. And I absolutely can tell you about my medium. In this piece, I use woodworking, steel, metalworking, plasma cutting. And uh, my special medium that I love is broken glass. When I make my work, the focus and the texture I use in almost every piece in this ongoing body of work is broken glass. And I take the remnants of leftover homewares from Goodwill and leftover pieces of glass artists process like stained glass artists. And I deconstruct those individual pieces and find ways to reassemble them. I, I really believe that the fractal beauty is something that exists in all of us. I think it's a part of the human condition and finding ways to break down, appreciate, the beauty and then um, reconcile is a beautiful aesthetic to carry yourself with. And so I attempt to carry myself in that way, finding beautiful things or the remnants of things that people consider no longer beautiful and finding new ways to enliven them. And I would argue that is that's how I try to affect the power of empathy for the environment in my daily life and in my artistry and in my art practice. Thank you, Amber. Up next, we have Marla. I'll be reading Marla's statement for her as she was unable to be here this evening. The interior world is porous. Where do I stop and where do you, the holy or nature or the energy between things begin? My work exists on that border of the unconscious and the present, listening for what is real. I express my states of mind and heart narratively with personal symbols that resonate for me. Crossing borders from one material to the next, interweaving images, textures and motifs to create wholeness and balance. Living in this natural world and the mythic world simultaneously, a wordless poem comes into being. This piece is called Hurricane Sandy, Haiti. It's a watercolor triptych that I made in response to that devastating event. It is an empathetic narrative response to that natural calamity. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Um, up next, we have Linda. Hi, my name is Linda Ford. Um, I got my MFA at the San Francisco Art Institute, and I lived in the Bay Area for about 25 years. Um, I relocated back to New England, uh, where I'm from, about seven years ago. Um, I want to thank Tanya and um, Weed, the curatorial committee, for including my work, um, and Weed for doing this great work in supporting women artists. Um, I wish I knew about you while I was in the Bay Area. <laughs> um, so this image is um, of a project that's ongoing. It's called Bodies of Water. And it's, um, there are interventions. I'm filling sidewalk cracks all over um, Providence with um, blue cement. And um, the recent work is very much about um, seeing the earth as a traumatized body. A lot of my past work has to do with how trauma exists in the body and sort of how it, um, it appears. Um, so cracks on the sidewalk, um, it was initially sort of a, a, um, a reparation, but it sort of became more about creating these miniature landscapes. Um, and uh, I document them and um, some of them 
stay. Some of them have have kind of fallen apart, but um, uh, the the images become um, miniature landscapes in the larger urban landscape of Providence, and they also sort of appear um, as the Earth's veins to me. Um, you can go to the next image, Tanya, please. Um, I grew up on coastal waters in uh, all over New England. Um, and I also spent a lot of time on, on rivers in California. And that's really where I sort of became aware of a lot of um, the issues we're facing now around water. Um, this image and the one, uh, the following image are both related pieces. Um, part of my MFA show was a, um, an installation called Archaeology of My Negative Space. And it, it was casts of all the negative space in my body. Um, so any little nook or cranny that could hold liquid, I cast and then put onto two tables similar to these with bright blue bottoms. And they became an archipelago of um, little islands. So this, this work is very closely related to that. Um, all of the objects are cast from the negative space of cupped hands. Um, and those are sort of pictured in the, in the rear um, charcoal drawings. And that, that image, um, that gesture is very much about giving and taking and sort of, um, you know, where we have gone awry, <laughs> I guess. Um, so the the um, the casts are on wooden, um, very textured kind of um, wooden panels that are tinted um, blue and reference water. So it's a um, sort of glacial landscape. Um, you can go to the next one, Tanya, please. Um, and this is uh, similarly a close up, but uh, it's it's a um, a series of images that are close-ups of the casts um, and digitally enhanced and um, manipulated to become close-ups of, um, of glaciers sort of floating in the night. Um, most of this work for me is very much about um, becoming or, or, or accenting our bodies in the landscape and sort of how micro and macro happens. And we, um, we, we often think, um, you know, that, that human beings and our culture is sort of the be all and end all. And what we really need to do is get that perspective of the micro and macro and see ourselves as a very tiny piece of the whole. Um, I'm, reading a book right now about whaling in New Bedford, and which is extremely sad, but there's a really great quote. Um, the author is Philip Hoare, and he's talking about sperm whales and how they exactly like us are um, made up of 90% water. And then he writes this incredibly beautiful sentence that um, says, we all um, have uh, oceans inside of us. So it's, it, it captured a lot for me in terms of what I'm thinking about in this work. Um, and um, yeah, and, the, and that the chaos, we are, we are part of the universe and the universe is part of us and shows up um, in us as chaos. And we, um, you know, acknowledging that I think would be um, a really big step in figuring out how to re make reparations for all of the things that we've done. <laughs> um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Next step. Oops. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Linda Gass, and I live and maintain a studio in the San Francisco Bay Area. My artwork entitled When We Listen to the Watershed is deeply rooted in empathy for the plight of the Santa Ana River, as well as empathy for the underserved and endangered communities living within the watershed. 
The artwork is 71 inches wide and 50 inches high by 30 inches deep. And it's made from multiple layers of transparent fabric with a sound component playing recorded voices and sounds of the watershed on speakers located behind the artwork. I was commissioned to make this artwork for the Langston Institute and Museum of California Art at UC Irvine. And it had to satisfy two conditions. One, it needed to relate to the local landscape. And two, I would collaborate with the research of a UC Irvine faculty member. I worked with an anthropology professor, Valerie Olson, who along with a team of researchers did an ethnographic study of the underserved communities in the Santa Ana River watershed to identify their strengths and needs to prioritize government funding for watershed improvement projects. Making an artwork about the Santa Ana River really appealed to me because the actual river is largely hidden in today's landscape. Like many Southern California rivers, it's separated from humans and the rest of nature by concrete channels and underground pipes. Yet it's the largest river in Southern California at almost 100 miles long. The river flows through what naturalist E.O. Wilson describes as one of the 10 biological hotspots in the world. Many plants and animals are unique to this watershed and still exist in the midst of a sprawling metro metropolis. The sound component is based on actual quotes from the people who were interviewed as part of Professor Olson's ethnographic research. They answered open-ended questions about their experience of living in the watershed. The original recorded interviews were destroyed after they were transcribed to preserve the anonymity of the participants. So since I couldn't use the original voices, I crowdsourced voice recordings of the quotes. Those voices were then mixed with ambient sounds of the watershed, such as running water, bird calls, and traffic noises. And the artwork itself is map-like, and I wanted the sounds to come from different locations on the map. So I worked with a sound designer, Jason Rainier, to build a four-channel sound system and create the sound loop. Next slide, please. Here you can see the layers of the artwork and how they convey a dissolve from an indigenous watershed to a highly engineered industrial one. The front layer is a painting of what the indigenous watershed may have looked like. And the back layer is the present day highly engineered industrial watershed. And then in the middle is the vulnerability layer. It's a map showing the locations of the underserved communities, endangered species habitat, contaminated groundwater, impaired surface water, and past wildfires. Seeing where these areas overlap is really revealing. Um, by having the indigenous landscape in front and on top, the artwork challenges and reverses the dominant settler colonial perspective of the industrial watershed infrastructure being built on top of and modernizing or improving a past or historical indigenous watershed. In creating the painting for the indigenous landscape, I sought out the input of local indigenous tribes. In my research, the only historical materials I could find were government sponsored historical maps and illustrations and descriptions and explorers journals. It felt wrong to only rely on these settler colonial documents created by the same communities who murdered and enslaved the indigenous people. I wanted to learn from the local indigenous people about their knowledge of the indigenous landscape. And I had the good fortune to work with members of the Tongva and Ahashman tribes. And they gave me input, reviewed my design and provided me with recordings for the sound loop. I incorporated their input and feedback. I was very careful to paint only approximate locations of the indigenous village sites in the landscape because the actual locations are protected archeological sites. I want this artwork to inspire viewers to feel curious about how we could take a justice-centered approach to restoring and managing the Santa Ana River watershed. And most importantly, I want people to understand that there are remnants of the indigenous watershed that are still here today, and that the indigenous people are still here today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Linda. Next up, we have Amore Mar Morris. And I'm going to read their statement. 
I aim to show how Western culture tends to negate and undermine the place of Black figures. I want to explore this displacement by bringing visibility to these figures and acknowledging the presence these usurped figures had in Western backdrops. I often superimpose a higher presence in a corrective manner. The intersectionality between the often overlapping trauma of Blackness, womanhood, and the disadvantaged class becomes readily apparent in my work. This plane of intersectionality is conceived from hegemonic powers that narrate our invisibility or roles as Jezebels, mammies, sapphires, or deviants. To combat this, I aim to depict Black beauty and excellence. My pieces break free from this imposed identity and explore new ranges. It's important to see the Black protagonist, the Black leader, the Black achiever, while still consciously alluding to and rectifying the imposed otherness of Black figures. My paintings create this fantastical fruitfulness that gratifies my inner child, but also often acknowledges the, uh, sorry, the making do of the past and the often unconventional charm these memories have. Although these adversities were present, there is a nostalgic lens I look back on my childhood memories with that points towards resilience. The intersection between the past, present, and reimagined spaces all pulled together to varying degrees in my work, in, to my, in my work statement specific to the piece Shelton Johnson calls. This piece focuses on where the intersection between race and class has informed my and many of our collective childhoods. I often think about how overlapping adversities of being Black and from a lower class makes areas of play inaccessible as a child. One reoccurring point of inaccessibility coming from these intersections is the inaccessibility of green space due to the mandated infrastructures of poor Black neighborhoods. I want to acknowledge the inaccessibility of some children to a, tr to a truly fruitful childhood. And the next piece we have is Leslie's. Hi, um, thank you very much for including me in this exhibition. I really appreciate it. Um, my, I grew up, uh, my gestalt really was my mother studied at the San Francisco Art Institute uh, under David Park. And I grew up with the Bay Area figurative as a gestalt. So I think that my art brings forward that uh, simplicity and boldness and shape and color that comes from that um, remarkable era. My grandfather was born on the Choctaw uh, Reservation in Oklahoma in 1892 and signed the Dawes Rolls. So I am a, an enrolled and voting member of the Choctaw Nation. And I strongly value the relationship the Native Americans have to the land and the wildlife and the value of the sp finding spirituality on our land rather than looking to the heavens for um, that inspiration. Additionally, my grandmother was an orphan Swedish Danish immigrant. And so I greatly value uh, the ability to uh, move around our planet and to appreciate uh, migration and change as we navigate our future. Uh, this piece specifically addresses growing up. And I think all of us have experienced that orphan uh, wildlife and it breaks our heart to wonder what happened to um, the parents, the mother probably in particular, and how we need to have the empathy for all life, not just human life, to frequently we value our species above all. And um, my paintings are deliberately designed to create equity. Um, frequently in wildlife, you see a side profile. However, when you do portraits of humans, for the most part, they're basically straight on. So I paint um, all life in my paintings. I, I try with equity to, and 
I believe that the eyes are the window to the soul of all life. And so I, I do focus on that. Um, next slide, please. Um, and in this piece, it's, it's specifically addressing the sadness that uh, in our world of how we have absolutely devastated our wildlife and uh, with zero respect for understanding that all life loves, cares, wants to live, has families. Um, and, you know, mink in this case, uh, specific, especially horrific, grazing them in farms, just their whole life is to die so that somebody can wear uh, a fur piece. And uh, I think California for in January outlined that. And um, uh, again, I hope that the, the dismay of those minks and the horror of the woman uh, as to what our practices are. So I am completely committed to empathy. Uh, today I unloaded a um, show at Laney Library um, with of native bee houses and a couple of paintings of this series. And the elevator was stuck. I have all my stuff loaded up and the, I can't get at, down in the elevator. So I'm yelling at this guy in the parking lot, you know, cause I came up on the elevator. And so um, he's going, what is this woman doing? And so he did, he pressed the downstairs button and then with an up button and got me. So again, the power of empathy and communication, we can go a long way if we help each other out and share the space and uh, care about each other. Thank you, Leslie. Next up, we have Emily. Good evening, everyone. I'm Emily Van Engel, and I have two watercolor paintings in the show. Um, the paintings are meant to be abstract, but the colors and formal elements um, are intentional. So I'll talk about that and my process and how the paintings relate to the power of empathy. I've been circling around the theme of environmentalism and ecological crisis in my journey as an artist. And throughout my explorations, I've held where we are with empathy and compassion for how we got here with an understanding of how challenging it is to make changes in the world that we inherited. I've gone back and forth between articulating the ways in which we're suffering to exploring how we might end that suffering. If you could go to the next slide, that would be great. The body of work I'm doing now relates to how we might end suffering. It started as kind of an art therapy for myself a few months into the pandemic, where I asked myself how I want to feel about certain aspects of my life, um, health, housing, relationships, and art. And I answered those questions through color. Uh, the next slide, please. I tinkered with different colors and landed with something that felt buoyant, peaceful lavender for health, a hot pink for a radiant home, black for universally understood art and royal blue for honest and clear relationships. Once I honed in on a palette that would support me personally, I set out to explore colors that would align with how I want to feel about the way we relate to earth as a society. I honed in on a warm, rich brown to represent a healed earth, a cool gray to represent ecological practices and policies that would be considered and well-designed, and mauve to represent a collaborative and stable democracy. Given the intersectional nature of environmentalism, I included indigo to represent the regality of racial justice, and I've also included a green gold color because to me it represents the vibrancy and spirit of life. Um, next slide, please. And it's gonna be a detail, one of the paintings. Um, my paintings include colors from both palettes, the personal and the social. In addition to color, I scripted words into the paintings to communicate the environmental specificity of my intentions. Painting with words feels like a risk because one of the rules I grew up with as an artist is that a painting should be able to communicate without words. But I feel like risks and trying new things are what we need in moving towards crafting the life that we want to live. Next slide, please. I also included earthly imagery, abstractions of tree, sky, flora, water, canyons, and rocks. 
And finally, there are parts that evoke weaving and fabric. To me, these threads painted in the colors in my palette represent strength and holding. Uh, next slide, please. The piece, How Does It Feel When Earth Loves You Back, puts me in a space of noticing my connection to Earth. The piece makes me wonder about living a life that is more connected, where I have the time and space to revel in this relationship. What it, would it look like if this relationship was our biggest priority? How could we support each other to live in reciprocity with Earth? If you go to the next slide. The piece, Another Way is Possible, gets at my core belief that we can live on live on the earth sustainably. Humans have been on earth for hundreds of thousands of years, and it's my biggest wish that we can survive industrialization and colonization. I imagine that in our next chapter, we would feel and be more connected to earth throughout everything that we do. Submitting my work to this show felt important because I see empathy and feeling as the backbone of the work. The palette is based on colors that correspond with the feeling, so feelings are a material in constructing the work. I'm also exploring if there's an emotionally safe way to address our climate crisis. The climate crisis is scary, and many of us are overwhelmed or not sure how to be involved because it feels so devastating. So guiding the conversation to a more imaginative space, asking what would be better than our current reality, it's a way to bring empathy into the conversation. So thank you for including me in the show and for the opportunity to share my work. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, the last artist we're gonna hear from tonight is Michelle. Hey. Hello, everybody. Um, first, thank you, Tanya and Weed for including my work in this exhibit. It's really, it's an important exhibit. And um, all of my, well, I'm a painter and environmental activist first, I, uh, mostly focusing on wildlife issues. And I, as I said earlier, I live in the Santa Cruz mountains, which is unceded a was, was land. Um, and really this work and all of my work is a plea for more empathy for everyone, but especially for non-human animals, because as other people, other artists in this exhibit have said so well, um, we often ignore the fact that we're not the only species on earth. <laughs> um, we're not the, and we're not the most important. Um, so for me, an empathetic world would include all species, not merely humans, and would throw human exceptionalism into the garbage heap of harmful and oppressive ideologies, along with misogyny, racism, homophobia, ableism, speciesism, and all forms of bigotry, which only serve to separate us. And I think that lack of empathy is one of the key causes of both the sixth mass extinction and the climate crisis. In terms of animals, too many people still believe that non-human animals are unintelligent and unfeeling, and therefore we humans are entitled to do whatever we want to them. But this belief is very mistaken. It's been misproven, disproven, and it's being misproven all the time by more and more scientific research that shows that animals are intelligent, emotional beings, really just in different ways than we humans are. They're not inferior to us, they are other nat nations. Um, I but um, one example of some really interesting research has to do with prairie dogs and that prairie dogs have languages. Um, they have distinct sounds that they make to warn each other about different kinds of predators, um, different things that are happening in their environment, and they have dialects. So prairie dogs in say Utah would not be able to communicate with prairie dogs in Colorado. And that's just, just one instance or one example of some of the research that's been going on, um, cognitive research around animals and their abilities um, but I think it's it's really important to put that out there since so many people in the general public still believe that humans are the be all and end all of creation and the non-human animals are not intelligent. So this first painting, I have two paintings in this show and the, this first one is called The Activist's Heart. And it's actually, I didn't realize it when I was doing it, when I was creating it, but afterwards I looked at it and I realized it was somewhat of a self-portrait 
because to be an empathic human who is bearing witness to the destruction of non-human animals means that our heartstrings are pulled this way and that from the knowledge of what we humans are doing. Um, and I have had quite a few other animal activists tell me that this painting encapsulates how they feel on a day-to-day -day basis. The individual images include a monkey and a rat being used in vivisection, um, a pelican caught in uh, an oil spill, specifically the Deepwater Horizon, uh, I wouldn't even call it a spill, <laughs> um, implosion disaster in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, um, a bear and tiger forced to perform for human entertainment, a rabbit caught in a cruel and painful leg hole trap, and chickens forced to live in horrific conditions to provide humans with eggs. Next slide, please. So this piece is called The Oceans of the Heart of the Earth. And it's inspired by my lifelong love of the ocean. I've lived in California my whole life. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles and learned how to swim in the ocean down in Southern California and um, fell in love with the ocean there. And for the last 40 years, I have lived first in Santa Cruz and now in the Santa Cruz mountains. Um, this painting in spe specifically is inspired by the biodiversity of Monterey Bay in California, which has been an important part of my life um, for the past four decades. Sometimes Monterey Bay is called the Serengeti of the sea because there's so much diversity of marine life there. And the diversity exists because the bay is host to the deepest submarine canyon on the US West Coast. So that causes um, upwelling from deep in the canyon. Um, nutrients cause upwelling from the bottom of the canyon and that um, just creates uh, a lot of food for plankton and uh, an entire food chain, including humpback whales and gray whales and orcas. And it's just a really, really amazing place. Um, so, it also, the diversity also exists because the waters were protected as part of the US Marine Sanctuary System 30 years ago. Everything we humans do on land affects our oceans and a recent study out of University of California, Santa Cruz shows that widespread microplastic in the digestive tracts of anchovies and common mers, which are a seabird that eats mostly anchovies. So um, that pollution is in our marine sanctuaries. I note here that I myself use acrylic paint, which is made from plastic. So even though I am not currently living in the Monterey Bay watershed, I am part of the problem too. Um, it is really hard to not be part of the problem, but I personally am looking at how I can make my art pro practice more environmentally sustainable because I consider the animals in Monterey Bay my kin and I don't wanna be harming them. Through my art, I aim to expose truths that are buried by the constant barrage of corporate media telling us to buy and consume more and more for our own happiness. When, in my opinion, happiness is found through our relationships, both with each other and with the natural world. My art is cultural resistance to ecocide. And that is it. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, and that brings us to yeah. the end of our presentation section of this talk. Um, thank you all so much um, for being here today. And it's so fabulous to just gain a little bit more insight into your the particular works that you have in the exhibition and also um, your practice. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share. And oops. okay, here we are. Um, I had one question that I thought I would throw out to all of you. Um, please feel free just to jump in and answer it. I'd really be curious to hear what all your answers are. Um, and then after that, I'm hoping you all might have questions for each other, and maybe the audience also might have questions. Uh, Feel free to throw in questions into the chat, and I think Mary, Mary or Manoush will will check on those. And Mary, you wanted to say something. You're you're um, muted. 
Mary, you are muted. Thank you. Thank you all. I just wanted to, at this point, before we start the questions and answers, give a little pitch to donate to WEED. Uh, as you know, we're a completely volunteer nonprofit group, and uh, we've just put in $6,000 to help redo our artist directory, which is about to, we'll be up about to make those changes by March this year. It's taken us quite a while, but hopefully it will fix some of the problems we've had from our 2012 website. So please uh, feel free to donate and your generosity is what keeps us alive and going. And um, we also are looking for another board member interested in web who knows um, WordPress, who can help us as we move forward with our digital platforms. And then the last thing I wanted to say, I'll put the links in the chat, um, is that Deanna Pindell is here, who is was the um, organizer for the and the head of the exhibitions committee. So just she needs to be included in acknowledgments. Thank you. Okay, back to Tanya. Great. Thanks so much, Mary. Um... So my, I guess my first question is many of these works that we've seen and the works in the exhibition, they reference situations, events, and behaviors that cause harm and suffering to other living things and the planet itself, while also often offering paths through that pain, avenues for healing, and hope for a better future. I would be curious to learn how in your work, in your practice, how you navigate that tension between bearing witness to the trauma and also holding space for that, for the hope that lies in the healing. Um, and maybe also talking about how, how this might relate to empathy for you. And anyone feel free to jump in. I'll jump in. Thanks for asking that question. It feels kind of like what I left off on saying or was attempting to get at and um, uh, the struggles of the piece, right? Um, four years of uh, just very turbulent. I think there's there's a kind of a, there's a turbulence and an uncertainty that comes with the future of the environment and, and not knowing. And the way I cope with that in my practice is, is that deconstructionism, finding ways to take moments of beauty, small things, and break them down or, or create meaning with those small objects, and then spending the time and focused energy to reaccumulate them in ways that feel personally meaningful and also reflect beauty. And I, the hope with the work is that by finding those objects and being able to transform them, other people, maybe even people who aren't artists, witness the work and understand that we have the ability to transform the way we treat objects, material, the environment, and we have a choice in the way we place meaning and value on them. And um, so it goes from this turbulent thing to the deconstruction, to the processing, to the remaking and the rebuilding. And um, it's so funny because most of those pieces of making the work are all private. They're not something that you see in the final object. Those are just the things I go through to make the work. Um, so it's always funny to talk about those pieces because they're the private moments in the work where I'm, I'm doing that with the objects to transform them in some way. Sometimes the hope is that by the time I'm done changing the object, you can't even tell what it originally was or its original essence. It's entirely transformed and been elevated in some way. Um, I personally process the trauma by knowing I've potentially made something more beautiful out of something that would have been overlooked otherwise. Um, I, for me, that that resonates with empathy. Empathy. Yeah, thanks so much for that answer, Ember. I think that actually speaks to a lot of what art making is, that transmutation of like one thing into another thing in this like specific example, the sort of transmutation of materials that maybe could be indicted in like the harm that humans are causing to the planet and 
transmuting that into something that is communicating um, something about the hope for the future, that there is, there's hope in that. Um, I, I sometimes find that, um, that I start with um, a problem and, um, and I want people to talk about it and I want people to um, stand in front of a piece and, um, and think about it. So what happens to me is I end up, I, I, want, I want to change people's minds sometimes. And so what happens to me is I make the piece as beautiful as I can. It's almost to trick people into engaging in the work itself until they stand there and go, oh, that's what that's about. And, um, and, and in that way, I can get them to perhaps think about the content of the work a little bit more um, instead of just passing it by and going, ooh, that's, you know, that's about that issue. I don't want to think about it because I think too many people are head in the sand kind of people. They turn away when they, they are faced with something difficult and they know it's wrong or they know it's a bad thing for the earth or whatever. And, um, and, and, and they just don't even want to engage in the piece. So I find that if the colors are vibrant or they're beautiful or something is um, mysterious about the piece, then they'll stand there and all of a sudden, oh, I, I understand what they're saying. And uh, that's important to me in my work anyway. I think that, um, Celia, you said it very well. I think that too many times, right now, I think we're in a, very dangerous period in the world. We've had several dangerous periods and a lack of empathy uh, by many. Uh, I would put it on the right mainly. Uh, you know, I think that one of the main movements of the uh, nationalism is in fact denial of empathy for anyone that isn't exactly like you. And I think it's incredibly dangerous. And I don't, I think it's between humans as well as uh, absolute uh, disrespect for other life forms. And many times the excuse is that I'm, you know, addressing the heavens, that uh, uh, the evangelical movement is saying God is telling me that I'm right and everybody else is wrong. And then the, if there's the group that just puts their hand, head in the sand and says, well, I just can't deal with it. And I think that we really need to use the power of art to encourage everyone to feel empathy across the board for all life forms and that the time is pressing and we must, we must arrive at that juncture. And I think that the uh, importance of this show cannot be understated. In my own work, it's that bearing witness to the trauma that actually becomes the subject matter of my work. And it's what inspires me to make an artwork. And I, like um, Celia and Amber, use beauty to then draw people in. I use beauty as a lure to get them to look at these difficult issues instead of just you know being in their face about it. And so I take that approach and that's how I reconcile these things through my work and also try to bring hope to it through that beauty. I add the same thing that um, I really love um, that Celia talked about small gestures. And I, I think about that a lot in the sort of interventions I do on the street there are things that can easily be ignored and walked over, but you know, my hope is that some people will stop and just take you know, a look at something and be surprised and you know, maybe sort of want to explore more what is that, you know, you know, and notice their surroundings more. I think a lot of trauma awareness and trauma recovery is about slowing the chaos in the world down and paying attention not only to what's 
all the little details that surround us, but also what's going on in our own bodies. That's sort of the essence, I think, of trauma recovery. Um, there's, if you all don't know this book by Elizabeth Grosh, um, she talks a lot about, um, it's a series of lectures I think she gave at Harvard. It's like only a little hundred pages, but I've read it five times, I think, because it's so deep. And she talks a lot about what art is and her view that we are, art is not a, an elevated um, uh, thing of the mind. It's an animal response. We respond to colors and patterns and beautiful things on a very physical level, the same way that animals do. And it's just really amazing. It talks about this issue a lot. I will add it into the... I was just gonna ask, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I just wanted to say something that you were talking about, Linda, about trauma and people's personal trauma. And I think it's very much linked to what's going on. I mean, obviously in terms of people who are oppressed and people who are, people who are the most oppressed among us and people who are feeling the impacts of the climate crisis for one most acutely, we're definitely having trauma, but I think we live in a very traumatized society. And I do, I, I, think, I think it was Linda Ford that said earlier, talking about the body of the earth as being traumatized and I see that too. Um, and I think, I think there are a lot of people who, I'm sort of formulating my, I've been formulating these ideas actually like the last couple of weeks <laughs> and, and you bringing that up about trauma like, kind of made me want to jump in with this. But I, I think that people's personal trauma is one reason why we have a hard, those of us who understand what's happening have a hard time getting through to the average person. Because first of all, people are just bombarded with images and news and stories and everything that's going on in the world, right? From multi, multi-directional and then their own trauma causes them to shut down you know we we have a society where it's just it's harder and harder for people to even survive and so how are they going to think about these bigger issues like how are we as a as a planet and as a people going to survive so i probably made more raise more questions than i <laughs> gave answers just now but it's just something i've been thinking about a lot about about personal trauma and how that how that is part of our greater planetary trauma, both for us humans and um, other life forms and the earth itself. I'll chime in too. Um, I go back and forth in my bodies of work about describing the suffering and the like articulating what's happening because I you know I really see it um but then also going to a place where I'm in now which is trying to find a pathway to alleviate that suffering and um you know I think I think part of like the act of making art is having that hope and belief that things will change you know even if you're talking about some if you're articulating something very terrible or being hopeful, I think the act of making art shows that you care and you want to come out of that. Um, and um, yeah, I think empathy has shaped my work because I, you know, I understand that people are like, um, a lot of you have said, really focus on, you know, they don't have the privilege to focus on these longer term concerns of environment and ecological crisis. Um, so, you know, how to how to engage that conversation, I think is, is one of the big questions that um, I grapple with and, and want to address. Thank you. Um, I think it's easy to be overwhelmed um, and, um, and because there are so many problems out there and they are overwhelming. <clears throat> and 
um, the way I get through it is to um, back up and look at small things and where we can um, affect change through small things. And, um, and then that gives me hope. Um, and um, like for instance, some um, service learning projects in schools um, where these high school kids are um, building um, shelters for uh, the homeless and they're so excited because they are involved and um, in, in um, righting a wrong and, um, and making positive uh, steps. Um, instead of just walking by homeless people and they are actually involved in the process and to me, that becomes a building block. If we can do more of that kind of thing, then we are affecting change um, on a greater scale, really, if we can do, uh, if we can multiply those kinds of efforts. But anyway, I, I, I tend to get overwhelmed in my own work. And I mean, I start a, a whole body of work and then I think, well, this is, this is just a small problem that you're working on. <laughs> you're not addressing, you know, there's so many other bigger problems. So, um, so that's when I have to pull back and I have to think, you know, okay, smaller scale here. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think I'm just reflecting on how, what you talked about, like the idea of offering like, help support assistance to others whether it's humans or other living things can also be incredibly healing for oneself um that there's also like the internal healing that happens as well um yeah was there anyone else who wanted to respond before i open things up okay well i would like to kind of open it up to you all and see if you have any questions for each other. Um, if you know any of the organizers have questions, if any of the audience has questions. Um, we are at, I think, 7.15 now. So Mary, how much time do we have? You're muted. Um, it's a little bit up to you. They usually an hour and a half is max. Okay. So, so it's up to you, up to everybody. Does anyone want to jump in with a question? I had one question. I don't know. I have to admit I'm ignorant for all of us. Uh, Linda uh, Gass, uh, is your sound on the exhibit? I have to admit I didn't listen to it if it's available, but is the sound available on the exhibit? It's, it's actually not. I didn't submit it as part of the work, but it is available on my website. And oh, okay. I'll yeah, it's a really beautiful sound loop. I crowdsourced 180 voice recordings from 45 quotes in the report. And then they're interspersed with all these different sounds of the watershed. So it's a 90 minute loop. And wow. I made it that long so that it wouldn't drive the gallery attendants nuts hearing the same things repeated over and over again. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah. Great, thanks. Well, I will throw out another question. Um, I would love to hear what you all are currently working on now and the ideas that you're excited about um, and good time to plug any exhibitions that you have coming in, coming up. I'll talk about when I was just in. Um... I um, I was in a group show and we're, we're hoping to have a travel um, at Tag Gallery in Los Angeles for um, October, November, and December. And um, it's called The Absent Referent. 
And it was a group exhibit of ecofeminist women artists that was inspired by the writings of Carol Adams, who um, about a little over 30 years ago wrote um, The Sexual Politics of Meat and The Pornography of Meat. Um, so the show, all of the work in the show um, really connected issues of oppression, um, connected how we uh, term those who are different from us, whether, you know, by race or gender or species um, into the other and how that causes us to um, turn a blind eye sometimes to exploitation. So that was really awesome. It was a wonderful experience and um, we're hoping to have it shown elsewhere, take it around. So be seeing if that happens. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, I'm in a show for the first time with my mother opening in Livermore. Um, um, I don't, I don't know right now. I, th I think it's at the Bothwell. Uh, I have to, I'll send out a notice to everybody so you can see it. But it's a, it's basically the next generation of Bay Area figurative artists. My mother lived in, uh, after, um, you know, living in San Francisco and going to the Art Institute. She and my father moved to Livermore, uh, where they spent their entire life, and uh, so they're kind of honoring her and then including me as part of the um, sort of the second. You know, she studied with David Park and. You know, women just, you know, we're not recognized. Uh, you know, Joan Brown is an exception and um, a few others, but um, so they are uh, honoring my mother. And so I'm very excited to be in the same show with her and I'll send out a notice. Great. Oh, it looks like Linda's maybe muted. Sorry about that. I'm working on uh, another public, um, or I should say some public installations. They're all um, sort of unsanctioned. <laughs> um, I think it was Leslie that mentioned something about, um, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it was PFAS, but it was something about um, contaminants being, um, you know, in animals and in, fish and in the water supply and it basically everywhere at this point. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading about that and I'm going to be doing it in some installations, hopefully at multiple locations that are near um, military sites um, that were, they've been major contaminant, you know, locations for PFAS and a lot of other things that are now seeped into all of our water. And um, they're, they're going to be some of the same castings of um the negative space of hands but they're in sort of boat shapes in there i've been looking at a lot of stuff in the RISD museum's collection that are kind of about um vessels like meaning military vessels water vessels and how those things kind of link together and make i'll be casting these little kind of boat shapes that are could be boats but they could also be some kind of a drinking vessel and i'm going to install them hopefully permanently somewhere around those places, but a lot has to be determined still. So I'm kind of excited about that. Yes, that sounds really exciting. Lorraine. Um, I'm currently in a, uh, a big group show in Richmond, California called the Art of the African Diaspora, which is uh, a large annual show of uh, Artists of African descent. It's in its 20, 23rd, 25th, very many years it's been running. So I got these things. I was actually just looking at a, um, the brochure for that show earlier today. Someone was telling me how fantastic it is. So. Lorraine, how long is that show up? I can't remember. Um, it's, it's all in February and into the early part of March. I'd, I'd have to get up and look at the postcard to tell okay. you. There's still time. The Richmond Art Center is, uh, you know, they, their uh, website has all the information about it. Um, I'm in the process of um, working on um, a show um, on women's issues, and um, and I'm 
excited about some of my pieces and um but i am not um and i I'm, I'm not near the end of of the body of work so um things have just i i get stalled every once in a while um because i need research more research much more research <laughs> I currently have some work in an exhibit along with the work of Tanya um, at the Palo Alto Arts Center. The exhibit's called Underwater, and it's really a fantastic uh, bringing together of wonderful artworks about many different aspects of water. And then I'm working on a large commission for a public art uh, project. It's the design for glass windows for the lobby of an affordable housing project in San Jose that's located a half mile from Los Gatos Creek. And so the artwork is about the changes to Los Gatos Creek over time and how the creek used to have salmon and beaver in it and those went extinct and now they're coming back. So mm -hmm. the windows are 48 feet wide and 20 feet high and so it's a morphing landscape and riverscape that goes across the windows showing the changes and i'm super excited about it. it's 79 units of low to very low income housing with 29 units of transitional housing for the unhoused with on-site social services that's great on so many levels, and it's super exciting to see how the health of Los Gatos Creek has been getting better, really due to, to activists, actually. Do you know about yes. that? Yeah, they, there's creek cleanups all the time now. Yeah. The beavers are back, and the Chinook salmon are back. It's great. Yeah, it's really incredible. I mean, part of it is the work that's gone on to clean up the bay, but then also to clean up the actual waterways. Yes. It's been really, yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, it's wonderful. Congrats, that's really cool. I was, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I was just gonna add something really quick. I, uh, uh, I am also working on a body of work that feels very new and exciting. And I think it relates to this theme, empathy, um, in similar ways. Funny enough, I'm Lauren, who's here with us today, uh, who shares my last name, uh, which I have also used for my artist's last name. Uh, the theme of my new body of work has to do with ancestry and really exploring my identity through my um, environmental and ethnic understanding of, of where I sit and who I am and how I've ended up becoming who I am due to my resources and my ancestors. Um, he used a term in a way I've never heard it called to ancestor. And I've been thinking about that a lot in combination with um, making works that involve materials and um, uh, objects that were given to me by my grandpa, grandma, and my family members in old photos, and really exploring abstract portraiture and sculpture um, using something called Dutch hexes. And uh, Dutch, the Pennsylvania Dutch specifically used to make wood barn signs that were bright painted geometric signs. And I've been creating three dimensional versions of these abstract geometric patterns and kind of um, collaging textures and meaningful materials on top of these forms to create um, radial designs and almost like mandalas that relate to my identity and my history and my ancestry. And uh, I'm really excited to see where that body of work goes. Um, I made the first piece a couple years ago. I had no idea it was going to start a body of work. And so now I've made like the second piece in this investigation and I'm very excited to see where it goes. It's very inspiring to hear what everyone's up to. I'm continuing to work on the body of work that includes the two pieces I have in this show. And um, my family and I just recently moved to where we are now. We just moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is Tewa land. And I'm hoping to build the body of work and um, show it locally. Um, but it's kind of slow going because I have a one and a half year old. So I'm, I'm learning how to balance everything. <laughs> Mm 
Amazing. Can I, ju can I jump in here a minute? I, I don't want to cut off any of the artists who are talking about their work. <laughs> but um, yeah, Ember, Ember is my niece. And um, I, I really loved what she brought in about ancestor. And uh, I, I did use ancestor as a verb uh, in terms of thinking, how can we be ancestors to the future? Or not only looking back into our ancestral uh, our origins, but uh, how do we want to become ancestors for the future? And um, so she was keying in on that a little bit, but I, I just really love the discussion and I love the artwork. I think what you're doing is so important. Um, and the, the, the discussion about trauma, um, personal trauma and how it's related to the trauma to the earth. And, um, you know, I, I know Gab Gabor Mate, um, says that uh, trauma is uh, it, it causes this um, this separation from the self so that we kind of lose lose that connection and so we look to exterior sources for affirmation and I that it, it just seems to me like the, the work that you're doing is uh, healing that disconnection from the self but in an even larger way um, the ecological self, the larger ecological self, and our connection to the planet. So I'm just really grateful for this work. It's very moving to see it. And um, this whole concept of empathy is just, it's just uh, so, so needed right now. Um, I think, the, you know, it needs to become the new archetype, you know? <laughs> the new archetypal energy. <laughs> coming through whatever whatever new archetypal images can carry that forth. Uh, we really need that. So thank you all. Thank you for that beautiful comment. Um, it looks like Mary has something. Um, I was just reminded to mention that this show evolved out of the um, topic for the magazine. So if you haven't read the last issue of the weed magazine it's called the art of empathy mm -hmm. and um think about writing or sending in interesting things that you'd like to contribute or ideas for the next magazine we're going to be looking for a title for and a theme mm -hmm. uh by march this year susan steinman's in charge and working on it mm -hmm. but if you have some ideas for a future topic that would be Wonderful. And we'll also hope to have an exhibition in tandem with the magazine as well next year. Thanks for that plug, Mary. I see a couple of people have turned their mute buttons off. So were there more thoughts? Yeah, Lorraine. I was just going to say uh, on the topic of, um, I, I really resonate a lot with what people have been saying and, and particularly with some of the trauma issues. And um, the ancestor, I, I just was recently in a show at, uh, in, at Somarts, which is a gallery in San Francisco, uh, which they have an annual Dia de los Muertos show. And I, um, the theme of the show at that time was uh, to love and be loved in return. And, you know, Dia de los Muertos is about the ancestors and honoring the ancestors, but I kind of turned it around because I'm really worried about the climate crisis and, and the potential for extinction. Um, the necessity for us to take action on the climate situation so that we will have descendants so that we get to be ancestors and that our descendants love us because we took care of business and um, turn this stuff around. I, I have to say, I don't have a lot of expectation that the actual sources of the climate crisis are actually going to be addressed despite all of our efforts. I, I one of the um, I'm also attempting to I, I will be showing this the work that I did there was a uh, a series a hundred coffins small ten inch long coffins with various um, um, items that had to do with our life on the planet and the lives of other beings plants and animals um, and earth dirt rocks um, and um, um, I will be showing it again uh, uh, towards the end of uh, March into a April uh, in Oakland. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll put some word out around that. Um, 
it, it, it reminds me of being a, of, of a person being in hospice. Like, what do you do when you're in hospice? You know, there's like a whole range of things that people do when they have, they know that their time is limited. I mean, we all know in some abstract way, yeah, I'm gonna die eventually because that's what happens when you're born. But um, but people approach end of life in a lot of different ways. And some are the things that a lot of us are doing, you know, making art, spending more time with your family, um, jumping out of airplanes, you know. Anyway, that's, I don't mean to ramble. The time is getting short. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any last comments? It looks like maybe Linda or Michelle. Nope. All right. I think that's actually an excellent point at which to wrap up the conversation. Um, thank you all so much for, you know, you submitting your work and for this like really wonderful conversation and letting us have a little bit more um, insight into into your process and into the thinking behind your work. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Mary. If there's anything else you wanna say? No, just thank you all for the beautiful conversation and dialogue at the end. It's made it really special. So I think we're done. Thank you. Wonderful. And I just wanna say thank you to everybody for responding to my emails and my uh, shepherding you to this point here this evening. So.